Hello everyone. I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. So in the today's INICT revision series, the topic which I'll be discussing is respiratory emergencies. As some of you were asking me about the discussion on the emergencies. So yesterday I have discussed the cardiovascular emergencies and today it will be the discussion on respiratory emergencies. So now the same scenario again like I'll be giving you the clinical scenarios and to this clinical scenarios you need to opt the most appropriate treatment that you should be giving. So I'll be giving uh, I'll be discussing the various different respiratory emergencies and you need to opt the best intervention that you have to do in this individual. So first and foremost is I have a 65 year old man with long standing COPD presents with severe shortness of breath and he has been treated with oxygen and nebulized bronchodilators. An hour later, the partial pressure of oxygen is 6 kilopascals and partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 16 kilopascals and pH is 7.2. So what is the intervention that you will be doing in this individual? Now, if you take the analysis the pH, it is like acidic pH because the normal pH is 7.36 to 7.44. The pH of the individual is 7.2 and the PaO2, it is reduced. The hypoxemia is there. So the individual is normal PaO2 is like 10.5 to 13.5 kilopascals. But in this patient, the PaO2 is reduced and you take PaCO2. The normal PaCO2 is 5.1 to 5.6 kilopascals. And in this patient, if you take, it is around 16 kilopascals. So the individual is having acidic pH, hypoxemia is there and as well as the hypercapnia is there. So this is what is suggestive of the respiratory acidosis, right? Because carbon dioxide is also increased and acidic and it is secondary to COPD. So the individual is having the respiratory acidosis. So now what is the best intervention that you will be doing in this patient? So you go through all the options. Intubation, left sided decompression, chest radiograph, nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation, 28% oxygen, nebulized solbutamol and oral prednisolone, emergency tracheostomy, 28% oxygen, nebulized salbutamol, intramuscular adrenaline, then right sided decompression and you take the next option 28% oxygen nebulized salbutamol intravenous hydrocortisone chest drain then 100% oxygen intramuscular adrenaline and nebulized salbutamol intravenous hydrocortisone and last option is 100% oxygen nebulized salbutamol intravenous hydrocortisone so now if you take this uh, clinical scenario of this individual he is a case of COPD with type 2 respiratory failure. So already the patient is on the oxygen, right? Already the patient is on oxygen. So the conventional management, previously what we used to do is, we used to directly intubate the patient, right? That was the conventional management. So conventional management would involve formal intubation, ventilator and transfer the patient to ICU. But in the recent days, once the individual has failed just oxygen therapy, the next important form of the oxygen supplementation is that is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. If non-invasive positive pressure ventilation does not improve the oxygenation of the individual, then we need to intubate the patient, right? Then we need to intubate the patient. So this non-invasive positive pressure ventilation it has been associated with reduction in number of patients requiring the intubation so first what we need to do is niv then if it is failed then you need to intubate the patient and uh, this niv very very important precaution is that the individual should be completely conscious and the individual should be a cooperative patient whenever you want to put the patient on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So in the clinical scenario which has been given to us, right, there is no point telling that the individual is drowsy or the individual is non-cooperative. So among the options which has been given to you, 
what do you think is the best intervention see the patient is already on nebulized bronchodilators so again giving nebulized salbutamol will be of no use already the patient is on nebulized bronchodilators so in this patient the best intervention is nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation and if this fails then you need to intubate the patient okay so this is the best intervention and you take all other options you take all other options like the options with which you may get confused is with your option e the patient you need to give 28% oxygen nebulized bronchodilator oral prednisolone see you should give 100% oxygen in this individual because hypercapnia is there hypercapnia will be effective in giving the respiratory drive so 100% oxygen you need to give in this individual not this 28% story okay now you would have the other option k that is 100% oxygen but intramuscular adrenaline we don't give in case of the copd patient and even you take option m right uh, 100% oxygen nebulized salbutamol then intravenous hydrocortisone see the patient is already treated with oxygen and we don't know what percentage of the oxygen the patient is getting we will assume that the individual is getting 100% oxygen because nothing is been mentioned and already he is on nebulized salbutamol so intravenous hydrocortisone will help definitely but the patient is on bronchodilators and he is a copd patient definitely we will assume that he is on the hydrocortisone as well so the best answer here will be nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation if it fails then you have to go with the intubation then how will you assess the cvrt of copd patients so we have the cvrt assessment criteria that is called gold criteria that is global initiative for obstructive lung diseases and what is a parameter that will assess the cvrt of your copd patients is that is fev1 by fvc normal value of your the fev1 by fvc it should be 70% and if it is less than 70% it tells you it's an obstructive lung disease and in this fev1 by fvc we take one parameter to assess the cvrt that is fraction of expired volume at the end of 1 second so in case of stage 1 the fev1 is more than or equal to 80% in stage 2 the fev1 is around 50 to 79% in stage 3 which is severe copd the fev1 is around 30 to 49% and in very severe copd which is stage 4 the fev1 is less than 30% so this is how you need to assess the cvrt of copd in mild we just give only saba that is short acting bronchodilator whereas in moderate along with saba we also need to add laba that is long acting beta 2 agonist or anticholinergic bronchodilators that is ipratropium bromide or thiotropium bromide to be added and in severe like we also add this corticosteroid and in very severe along with above we also need to add the long term oxygen therapy so this is about the cvrt assessment and as well as the treatment of the copd patients now you take the second clinical scenario so in the first clinical scenario like what we need to do is intermittent positive pressure ventilation so here the answer is d you take the second clinical scenario a 17 year old woman presents with wheez and marked perioral swelling and partial pressure of oxygen is 7 kilopascals normal value is 10.5 to 13.5 so po2 is reduced in this individual pseo2 is 4.1 normal value is 5.1 to 5.6 so co2 is also reduced in this individual so what is the effective treatment in this patient so if you see here the individual is having wheeze and the marked perioral swelling what do you think is the diagnosis suggestive of this particular patient is having acute anaphylactic reaction right the patient is having acute anaphylactic reaction which is your type 1 hypersensitivity reaction so in case of acute anaphylaxis what is the best treatment that you need to give in this individual so the answer is like you need to give 100% oxygen therapy intramuscular adrenaline and nebulized salbutamol nebulized salbutamol and one option which you may get slightly confused is with the 28% oxygen please remember you should give 100% oxygen in case of acute anaphylaxis it is not 28% oxygen and the another option 
विच यू मे फील लिटिल कन्फ्यूज इज अबाउट द ऑप्शन एम दैट इज हंड्रेड परसेंट ऑक्सीजन नेबुलाइज सैलबिटामॉल एंड इंट्रावीनस हाइड्रोकॉटिजोन लेट मी टेल यू ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर अक्यूट एन एफ्लैक्टिक रिएक्शन इज एड्रीनलिन राइट इट इज नॉट हाइड्रोकॉटिजोन इट इज एड्रीनलिन इन केस ऑफ अक्यूट एन एफ्लैक्टिक रिएक्शन सो इफ यू टेक दिस अक्यूट एन एफ्लैक्सिस इट इज ए टाइप वन हाइपर सेंसिटिविटी रिएक्शन लेट मी जस्ट गिव यू ए क्विक रीकैप ऑफ ऑल द एनफ्लैक्टिक रिएक्शन वेर यू हैव वन टू थ्री फोर टाइप वन इज आई जी ई मीडिएटेड राइट विच इज एलर्जिक सो द न्यूमोनिक इज एसिड राइट द न्यूमोनिक इज एसिड ए स्टैंड फॉर एलर्जिक टाइप वन एंड टाइप टू इज साइटोटॉक्सिक or antibody mediated like your good pasteur syndrome hemolytic reactions hyper acute graft rejections all they come under your cytotoxic i stands for immune complex mediated igm or igg mediated type 3 examples are hypersensitivity pneumonitis systemic lupus erythematosus polyarthritis nodosa and as well as the serum sickness that will be type 3 and type 4 will be delayed hypersensitivity reactions and this delayed hypersensitivity reactions examples include chronic graft rejections purified protein derivative test like that is nothing but your mantu test for your tuberculosis latex agglutination test and in case of nickel poison so these comes under your type 4 hypersensitivity which is nothing but delayed hypersensitivity reactions so now what are the points which will tell you in the clinical scenario that it is an acute anaphylaxis these include the presence of the periorbital or perioral swelling which is nothing but edema and the individual is also having wheez and this particular wheez is mainly because of laryngeal edema and what are the other features of acute anaphylaxis they include rash edema tachycardia hypotension and as well as wheez and it is this laryngeal edema which is responsible for upper airway obstruction and that is what makes the individual to do the endotracheal intubation but before doing the endotracheal intubation the initial treatment of choice is you need to give epinephrine that is 0.5 ml and whenever you are giving intramuscular what should be the dilution of the epinephrine one is to 1000 solution that comes at around 500 grams okay so the dilution should be 1 is to 1000 solution whenever you are giving intramuscular you should not give intravenous in case of the acute anaphylaxis whenever you are giving intravenous you should give it very slowly the dilution should be 1 in 10000 and in which clinical scenarios you give the intravenous is in case of a frank cardiac arrest in case of a frank cardiac arrest we give intravenous epinephrine okay so this is about the second clinical scenario so second clinical scenario is what acute anaphylaxis and in this second clinical scenario what is the uh, treatment that you will be giving in this individual it is 100% oxygen intramuscular adrenaline and nebulized salbutamol now you take the third clinical scenario third uh, card respiratory emergency a 14 year old with asthma presents with acute severe asthma attack pao2 is like 10 kilopascals so pao2 is reduced because normal value is how much 10.5 and pseo2 is 8 kilopascals normal value is 5.1 to 5.6 so co2 is elevated so this individual is also in a state of a type 2 respiratory failure right type 2 respiratory failure where you have hypoxia and as well as hypercapnia so now what is the ideal or the best management in this patient so in this individual like you need to give 100% oxygen right why i'll tell you then drug of choice in acute attacks of asthma is salbutamol right drug of choice in acute attacks of asthma is salbutamol and along with that you need to give intravenous hydrocortisone so in the third clinical scenario like you, you see 28% oxygen will not be sufficient at all so your option e option g option i are gone and you have option k option k is what intramuscular adrenaline is there so we don't give intramuscular adrenaline in case of an acute attacks of asthma so the answer in this clinical scenario is 100% oxygen nebulized salbutamol and intravenous hydrocortisone now let me tell you how to assess the cvrt of the bronchial asthma 
So how to assess the CVRT of bronchial asthma is like we will classify the patients into mild, moderate, severe and as well as the respiratory arrest. And breathlessness will be there in almost all the cases of asthma. But the functional assessment is being done by peak expiratory flow rate or FEV1 percentage. If FEV1 percentage is more than or equal to 70 percent, it is mild. If it is 40 to 69 percent moderate and if it is less than 40 percent, it is considered to be severe. And if less than 25 percent, then the individual is supposed to have the respiratory arrest. And in cases of your severe and as well as respiratory arrest, these individuals are supposed to have even the cyanosis. And characteristic pulse that is pulses paradoxes, pulses paradoxes is present in case of the status asthmaticus that is in case of severe asthma, there will be the pulses paradoxes. Whereas in respiratory arrest, the absence of the pulses paradoxes suggest that there is respiratory muscle fatigue and in severe form of asthma there will be tachycardia where the heart rate will be more than 120 but in respiratory arrest the individual will go into a state of the bradycardia okay so if you take our clinical scenario now the individual is having a 14 year old individual acute severe asthma so the question itself tells you it is not respiratory arrest it is an acute severe asthma and the individual is in type 2 respiratory failure so in this clinical scenario the best option for the treatment is 100 percent oxygen nebulized salbutamol and the intravenous hydrocortisone should be given now what about the intubation right what about the intubation so please remember one important point here see if the patient is not responding to drug therapy then you have to go with the intubation. So please don't jump onto the option of the intubation. The first option like what you have is intubation. Only if the patient does not respond to drug therapy, then we need to do the intubation. And usually most of the time in patients with asthma, along with hypoxia, there will be hypocapnia. But our patient is having hypercapnia. So that tells you that the individual is having poor prognosis. So this patient is having hypoxia, and retaining carbon dioxide also. So this tells the individual is having poor prognosis because most of the time they will also have low CO2. The presence of high CO2 is as associated with imminent respiratory collapse, right? It is associated with imminent respiratory collapse. So despite elevated carbon dioxide, 100% oxygen should be given because in this patient, there is no risk of respiratory depression resulting from a hypoxic ventilatory drive. Between the attacks, the patient carbon dioxide should be within the normal range and it is a common mistake to restrict the oxygen to patients with asthma and high oxygen, high carbon dioxide. So, in the third clinical scenario where the individual is having acute severe asthma attack, the answer is M. That is 100% oxygen, nebulized salbutamol and intravenous hydrocortisone. Now, we will move on to the fourth clinical scenario. So, if you take the fourth clinical scenario, a 28-year-old man involved in a road traffic accident presents with respiratory, severe respiratory distress. Examination reveals decreased expansion on the right side of the chest with mediastinum shifted to left. So what is the treatment that you will be giving in this individual? So what is this case suggestive of road traffic accident, severe respiratory distress and decreased expansion on the right side of the chest and mediastinum shifted to left side. So the differential diagnosis will be pneumothorax. Right and that too a tension pneumothorax or the another important differential diagnosis will be hemothorax. Right. So these are the two important differential diagnoses. But after this road traffic accident, in between these two, the most common will be the pneumothorax rather than the development of the hemothorax. Now, what is the ideal treatment that you will be doing in this patient? So what is this now? It is a case of uh, attention pneumothorax, let us assume, because the individual is having severe respiratory distress. Because in case of hemothorax, the respiratory distress will be there 
but more or less it is gradual to acute in onset but in pneumothorax it is definitely acute in onset so we will assume that the patient is having pneumothorax because he did not mention anything about the breath sounds if breath sounds were mentioned as like absent it would be definitely pneumothorax right but breath sounds have not been mentioned the other findings are in favor of both pneumo and as well as hemothorax but most common will be pneumothorax because the individual is having severe respiratory distress now in this patient like the individual has developed tension pneumothorax what do you think is tension pneumothorax tension pneumothorax is that where whenever the individual inhales the air enters into the pleural space right air enters into the pleural space but whenever the individual exhales the air does not come out it gets accumulates it keeps on accumulating within the pleural space with every inhalation so in these patients with the tension pneumothorax there will be increase in the intrathoracic pressure right there will be increase in the intrathoracic pressure so this increased intrathoracic pressure will decrease the venous return of the individual will decrease the cardiac output and at the same time will also decrease the blood pressure of the individual mm, decreases the venous return decreases the cardiac output and as well as decreases the blood pressure and once blood pressure is decreased there will be decreased cerebral perfusion and there will be decreased coronary perfusion because of decreased cerebral perfusion the individual can have cerebrovascular accident and because of decreased coronary perfusion the individual can have the myocardial infarction so now this is a definitely an emergency so what you have to do in this patient now what you have to do is you need to do the right sided decompression because the individual is having decreased expansion on the right side and mediastinum is shifted to the left side so you need to do the right sided decompression so how how is that you will do the right side decompression like you need to take a white bore needle and you need to puncture the pleura right you need to puncture the pleura in the second right intercostal space in the mid clavicular line okay second right intercostal space in the mid clavicular line you need to puncture the pleura and that will cause the decompression for suppose right for suppose if the white bore puncture does not decrease the respiratory distress then like what you need to do is you need to put an icd right that is intercostal drain has to be put so now in our patient the decompression should be done as the first line treatment first is your white bore needle puncture of the pleura if it fails then the intercostal drain has to be put now let me quickly recap about the pneumothorax we have two important forms of pneumothorax traumatic and spontaneous traumatic it includes like blunt trauma secondary to penetrating trauma or secondary to iatrogenic spontaneous like primary and secondary spontaneous primary spontaneous is that it is seen in case of tall thin male smokers and there is as such there will be no underlying lung disease no clinical evidence of lung disease and without the precipitating event whereas secondary spontaneous pneumothorax is that where you have an underlying lung disease as a complication of the underlying disease process so this is what is your secondary spontaneous pneumothorax okay and how will be the chest x-ray findings in patients with the pneumothorax the chest x-ray findings they will have hyperlucent lung fields right hyperlucent lung field and lung is completely collapsed and mediastinum will be shifted to the opposite side so this will be the very important chest x-ray findings in patients with the pneumothorax so this is your collapsed lung your hyperlucent lung field is nothing but the presence of air in the pleural space and the entire trachea so you can see that this is the mediastinum which is nothing but trachea shifted to the opposite side okay next then followed by that so in this fourth option the fourth clinical scenario you need to do right sided decompression now you take the fifth clinical scenario the fifth clinical scenario is a young man 
presents with acute onset shortness of breath. Examination reveals decreased expansion on right side. Saturation is 95%. So the individual is having acute onset shortness of breath and decreased expansion on the right side. But saturation is normal, 95%. So acute onset breathlessness with decreased expansion of the chest on that side, you can have in case of pneumothorax. Because what are the respiratory causes for acute onset breathlessness? One is pneumothorax, ARDS, pulmonary embolism, acute exacerbation of COPD, acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma, severe anaphylaxis but in all these conditions whatever i have said you for acute onset breathlessness of respiratory origin only in case of pneumothorax you will have decreased expansion on the right side but the patient is having saturation 95 percent so what will be the most appropriate intervention in this individual see uh, the patient might be having a very minimal pneumothorax so in order to look whether the individual is having a minimal pneumothorax or a massive pneumothorax what you have to do is you have to do the chest radiograph chest radiograph is indicated to confirm the diagnosis of pneumothorax and to assess the degree of collapse because in healthy patient for suppose if it is a small pneumothorax you don't require to do any intervention they will heal without any intervention so what you have to do is you have to observe the patient for nearly around six hours if there is no increase in the size of pneumothorax, he may be discharged with early follow-up and repeat chest x-ray. That's all. If the individual has no increase in the size of pneumothorax or if there is no worsening of respiratory distress, even within six hours, you can discharge the patient. Then ask for an early follow-up. Right? In what are the causes for the minimal pneumothorax mainly in young adults the spontaneous pneumothorax is very common and that is very common in case of tall thin male smokers and it is also very common in older patients with emphysema so in patients with thoracic disease or large pneumothorax simple aspiration is recommended but if it is like small pneumothorax just observe the patient you don't require to do any aspiration only if this simple aspiration fails in case of large pneumothorax then chest drain will be required now what are the causes for recurrent pneumothorax right so the causes for recurrent pneumothorax one is your catamenial lung diseases which is seen in females with pulmonary endometriosis so in these patients with catamenial lung diseases they will have pneumothorax every month whenever they have the menstrual cycle that is one of the cause for recurrent pneumothorax and your pneumocystis gervaisi pneumonia can cause recurrent pneumothorax then in patients with paraseptal emphysema where you have the bulla they can also have the recurrent pneumothorax so these are all the conditions for recurrent pneumothorax you need to assess the cvrt and then you need to treat the patient so for that like you need to do the chest x-ray first one of the very very important sign in case of the pneumothorax is the deep sulcus sign so like in order to get the deep sulcus sign you have to check you have to take the chest x-ray in supine position so when you take the chest x-ray in supine position you will have abnormally radiolucent costophrenic sulcus and this radiolucent costophrenic sulcus is nothing but your deep sulcus sign right that is nothing but your deep sulcus sign so finally if you see the essentials of or like quick recap of pneumothorax remember this pneumothorax it is acute in onset in mild cases you have minimal physical findings they have only unilateral chest expansion on the affected side the chest expansion will be reduced there will be de decreased tactile frematus, hyper resonance will be there, diminished breath sounds, mediastinum is shifted to the opposite side and in severe tension pneumothorax they will have cyanosis, hypotension will be there in tension pneumothorax and within the chest radiograph you have the presence of the pleural air. So these are the five important respiratory emergencies. The first important respiratory emergency is COPD, acute exacerbation, type 2 respiratory failure and 
second emergency is your acute anaphylaxis where they require intramuscular hydrocortisone and third is acute severe asthma attack where you need to give salbutamol nebulization intravenous hydrocortisone and 100 percent oxygen and fourth important emergency is like tension pneumothorax where you need to do immediate decompression and fifth important is the mild pneumothorax where you need to do chest radiograph in order to assess the CVRT of pneumothorax. So these are the respiratory emergencies. So if you have liked this particular video, just press on the like button and just mention which topics you require in the subsequent sessions for the INICT or FMG or NEET PG for quick revision. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow again.